I am manager of relationship marketing at Cancer Council, which which Tracy's talked of. I do manage a portfolio of more than $5.7 million with a team of individuals. Uh, I'm one of two people that look after revenue generation from Cancer Council and I have 60% of the income, I'm responsible for 60% of the income that we generate from the community. So I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, how I got to where I am today and what the decisions I've made. So I'll give you a little bit more detail about my current role and also about Cancer Council SA, which I'm sure you know about since uh, we're obviously industry partner for the semester. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I'll also tell you about my work history and things that I have been exposed to in my working career. Uh, and also the lessons learned, because I think the most important thing for you is a take-home message that I can give you today about what I have felt have been instrumental uh, lessons that I've learned along my way. And they're not around academic study, they're not around opportunities that someone's just given me, it's around what I identified as being the most fundamental points that I've learned to actually enable me to develop my career. So my role is Manager Relationship Marketing at Cancer Council SA. For your, those of you who don't know, uh, Cancer Council was established in 1928. Uh, it is an organisation with a vision to beat cancer in South Australia. The way that we achieve this is through funding cancer research. You'll probably see the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute building being built um, behind you in front of me. Uh, we don't fund the infrastructure but we fund the cancer research that goes on um, and will go on in that building. It's $2 million of revenue each year. We're a non-government funded organisation so that revenue is generated by individuals in the community that fund us for our critical work. We also pursue um, prevention support activities. So um, prevention activities include things like uh, advocating to the government to ban smoking um, in our fresco areas or um, plain packaging uh, of cigarettes. So essentially it's trying to help individuals in the community cut their cancer risk. Uh, we also do support services. So we have three accommodation facilities as an example of some of the support services we offer for individuals that are undergoing cancer treatment that are from rural areas and unable to afford accommodation in the city for as long as six to eight weeks at some times. So those accommod accommodation facilities are, are subsidised um, and again because of the wonderful generosity from the community we're able to provide those services. We also have a helpline 13 11 20 that anyone can call. They have questions about cancer, anything to do with cancer. It could be a friend that has cancer, a relative, you may have um, experience of cancer. You can call and ask any questions to our trained oncology nurses. So my role is, uh, again, it generates the revenue outside of fundraising activities. So I know that some people from the Global Experience Program have um, done some wonderful volunteering for Daffodil Day, which was very much appreciated. Uh, so we have a, a wonderful volunteers who support us with all our fundraising activities. Um, but I, I look after the revenue that's outside of the fundraising campaign. So anyone that wants to give us a donation could be a major gift. It could be a bequest uh, in someone's will. It could be um, a corporate partner who wants to donate revenue to us for corporate social responsibility, our appeals process. So when people are actually donating to our brand, not to our sub-brand, that's what I manage. Hopefully that makes sense. Probably a good time, I should have mentioned it earlier, that you can ask me questions throughout the presentation. If you don't know what I'm saying, if I've said a term that you don't, you don't know, raise your hand, ask the question. Most people in the room probably don't know what I'm talking about too if you don't, so ask the question. Any questions at this stage? No? Cool. Okay, so about me. So I was born in the Brossa Valley, north of Adelaide, um, wine region. My family do um, come from uh, the wine industry and the wine making industry. I have three older siblings. And they were the ones that instigated me to get a career at a, well, get a job at a very young age, I should say. So it did start when I was 13. I was almost 14 when I started. And admittedly, I started as a kitchen hand. Not a chef, but I couldn't find a kitchen hand photo. Um, and within, within one week, I was uh, asked by the owner of the organisation or the cafe to be a waitress. And the reason why he said he wanted me to be a waitress is because he thought I was friendly and personable and could actually communicate well with the customers. So one week I was uh, working as a waitress part time while I was at high school. And I continued to do that until I left high school. Once I'd left high school, again in the middle of year 12, I went and worked in the city, moved here and started doing full time waitressing. 
An opportunity came up for an assistant manager position uh, in the city at a Rundle Street, a very popular Rundle Street restaurant named Eros Ozeri. I didn't think I could get the job, but I applied anyway. And I went for the first interview and I thought it went okay, but I thought, no, the calibre of individuals that they would have would be far, far better than me. I was 19 at this stage, so I almost was certain I wasn't going to get it, but I still applied. They invited me for a second interview, which I knew that they were just going to tell me that I wasn't going to get the job. I was almost reluctant to go. It was raining. I lived in Grange at the time. I had to drive all the way to the city. And I thought, I'm not going to go. They're just going to tell me I don't have the job. There's no point. Anyway, I, I went. Uh, reluctantly, I went and got dressed up and got there very early in the morning. And they said, you've got the job. We want, we want you to be assistant manager of our restaurant. And that was a huge achievement. For those of you who know it, it's Eros Uzeri, um, a Greek restaurant in Rundle Street in the city. At that time, it was very popular. It was the busiest restaurant on the street. And I was very challenged, <laughs> which I loved. And I had an opportunity to manage people, to manage rosters, to grow myself, to understand the intricacies of customer service and I pursued myself to really refine what it meant to um, please the customer because it's about them, it's not about me. So there were times where all my friends were going out on a Saturday night and I was working. There were times when my friends were going out on a Friday night and I was working and I'd been that person since high school. I was always the friend that never went out. I was always the friend that was working. <laughs> I know, it's alright, I'll try and make up for it one day. <laughs> um, so I, I continued to do that and I thoroughly enjoyed it. This was the first time I had an opportunity at Eros to also do some extra ac uh, curricular activities. They enrolled me into a Certificate 3 in Frontline Management, which was very fitting for what I wanted to do. So that was the first time I actually did any formal qualifications after I left high school. So I did the Certificate 3, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I think that's what probably gave me the passion um, and the hunger to learn more, but more about that later. So after two years of, of assistant managing the restaurant at Eros, I started getting a little bit anxious. I was worried that I was going to be in hospitality for the rest of my life. I knew that's not what I wanted. I wanted to gain a lot more experience and exposure. I wanted to get out of hospitality. I knew that. I, didn't not, I knew that I didn't want to be in hospitality. So what I did is talk to people. <coughs> So I, met, I know that you have a subject on this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it was fundamental in my career, so I'll just briefly touch on this. Um, I started talking to people that I'd met through the restaurant, customers, friends that I'd had in the past, um, and just spoke to them about the fact that I wanted to get out of hospitality, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't understand what my skill set was. I knew I could talk to people. I knew I liked people. I knew I was good at upselling, but I didn't know how I was going to apply that to another industry outside of hospitality. So through making contacts, someone suggested sales. I think you'd be really good at sales. And I thought, oh, okay, well, yeah, maybe, but how do, I, how do I get into that industry? So this one particular person uh, introduced me to his friend who was in aftermarket sales, so selling car accessories like spoilers, tinting, tinted windows, cruise control, side skirts, for anyone that knows what that means, big rims, tires making cars look good, essentially. Um, someone introduced me to a person that was in aftermarket, and she said, you've got to get into aftermarket. It's phenomenal. You'd be great at it. The earning capacity is huge. There are huge opportunities. You should do it. And I went, oh, OK, great. She introduced me to somebody, and I got an opportunity to work in aftermarket. I did not sell anything like this. <laughs> but I did Sorry sell. <laughs> <laughs> I did not sell anything like this, unfortunately. Um, but I did have a 100% sell through ratio most weeks, which means that every single customer that purchased a car from the dealership I was working at purchased from me. Whether it be tinting, cruise control, side skirts, whatever it is, they purchased something from me. So I knew that, yes, selling was probably something I was pretty good at. I enjoyed it. I loved interacting with customers. So I knew that from, from my hospitality experience. But I was also good at selling stuff. This is great, I thought. But that was short-lived because I suddenly realised the car dealership culture was not for me. It was not the environment I wanted to be in. And also, when my friend was talking to me about those opportunities that she's experienced in aftermarket, were actually not what I was wanting from opportunities in my life. She was talking about earning, earnings. I was talking about career development. How can I continue to pursue my, my career and work my way up the corporate ladder? So 
I, I coincidentally received a phone call from uh, one of the contacts I'd made at Eros. He was a customer and he'd always asked me to go and work uh, for him in the business he was working at. And I'd always said no for some unknown reason. And then he called me and said, we have an opportunity, would you like to seize it? And I said, I was a little bit arrogant at the time, admittedly, and I said, I'm happy to hear a proposal. Because I knew my earning capacity here apparently was amazing, but I knew that the culture wasn't that good, so I wasn't sure. So I went and met with him. I thought, well, why not? It's good to have that contact. It's good to make that connection. I'll go. So we had a coffee, and he told me about an opportunity at Entertainment Book, um, which is the number one dining guide in Australia. And that's how I started there. So I'll just explain for those of you that don't know, Entertainment Book, again, the number one dining guide in Australia. It actually has a lot of offers for restaurants and leisure activities, 50% and 25% off uh, in South Australia. So my role initially was account manager, looking after merchants, so individuals, in the book. So this was a really good opportunity for me that I was very excited about and I'm very pleased that I made the decision to go and try it and see what it's like and pursue something. So this, this is where I got exposure from a sales perspective but also incorporated marketing and some management. So I knew from when I started at entertainment that this was a great uh, business for me to be able to pursue my career. Even though it had limited staff in Adelaide, I think there was about 10 at the time, there were offices around Australia that I could potentially pursue careers in. But from the day one, I recognised that the role I wanted was actually my boss's role, Merchant Services Manager. <laughs> and I did what I know best and I, I basically befriended him and he was my mentor for a whole year. I went out with him, I listened to him, I understood what he was trying to achieve, I, look, I learned from his mistakes, I adapted his strengths and skills to suit me, and he was offered a, another job a year later. <laughs> and he recommended, it was divine timing, he recommended that I applied for his role. Now, I just want to tell you, he's 32 and I'm 22 at this stage. So in my mind, not a chance would I get this role, but again, a bit like Eros assistant manager, I applied for it and I got it, which was a huge achievement for me. In fact, I was the first female ever to be promoted to, national, to merchant services manager nationally. So it was very exciting and I was 22 and I, I remember celebrating when you get, like when you get a high distinction. I remember celebrating and standing at the bar saying to my friend, I cannot believe I'm here. I honestly thought I'd get here in five years time, not today. I can't believe it. And he said to me, what did you do? What, how did you do this? And I said, I just made friends with people. I made friends, I worked very hard and I refined my skills and I continuously developed myself. So I was there for another three years working as Merchant Services Manager and when I say I was exposed to the management side of things, I was uh, uh, developing the account managers, which I formerly was, to help them um, learn some of the skills of a, of a Merchant Services Manager. Thoroughly enjoyed that, but I started thinking that I needed a new challenge. I was good at it now. I got to the point where I was very good at what I did, but I wasn't being challenged. I wasn't actually getting any new skill set. So, I, I made a decision to move to London and I made that decision, I think it was within 48 or 72 hours or something and I bought a ticket and said, I'm leaving in six weeks time and it's a one-way ticket. And everyone tried to talk me out of it even though I'd already bought the ticket, so there's no point talking me out of it. And I thought, no, this is what I need to do. I need to go now when I'm young, when I can get a working holiday visa and when I can actually experience a whole bunch of things that I know deep down that I need to do. London was not as exciting as I anticipated to begin with. It was very, very, very hard. There were many times where I was almost homeless, where I had absolutely no money. I did put a picture in about that. <laughs> And it was very scary and I remember my family saying to me, we will pay for you to come home because this is, this is ridiculous. And my answer was, that is too easy. It's too easy to get on a plane and go home and be at home with mum and dad and start again in my mind. So I pursued and six months later, there was a job that came up at a brand consultancy called Quiet Room. 
I did have some temporary jobs in between there, I will tell you that. Um, I had to somehow not get on the street. Um, so I did have some jobs and some, some form of income coming in. Um, but I finally found a job at Quiet Room, which I couldn't do again. Um, the name, the role was project manager. So Quiet Room were a growing agency. They worked with uh, government and banks to help them develop their brand language. Uh, so essentially they, they consulted with them, they helped them develop all their marketing literature um, to communicate with their audiences essentially. So you can see here we worked with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, um, AXA, Prudential, Halifax Bank of Scotland. So I applied for the role and met the managing director. And he said, <clears throat> this is a very intense job. We're a growing organisation and we actually need someone to manage one of our biggest clients, which is Fortis Bank. And I said, yep, I totally understand that. And I can do it. I promise you I can do it. I have the determination. I've got skills within entertainment publications where I manage the number one entertainment book in South Australia or in Australia. I have had customer service skills. I know I have a capacity to manage a large workload. I can do this. Admittedly, he did take a chance because it was a growing business. It was his main client. If I didn't do the job very well, they would have gone into receivership. So he took a chance with me. And I managed Fortis uh, Project, which was incredibly exciting. Um, my husband wanted me to tell you this next bit, but I said I wouldn't, but now I'm going to. Um, the very first week that I started at Quiet Room, I, had a, I held a meeting at Fortis Bank. And it was in the boardroom. There were directors uh, from Fortis Bank there. There were researchers from Quadrangle, who was a research and development organisation, and their managing partners. My two managers, uh, owners of the organisation were there, and a couple of uh, com uh, compliance and underwriters. And I held this meeting about how we we're going to execute this project. And after I finished, the, the partner at Quadrangle, the research company, said to my boss, I want Kate, how do I get her? He goes, you can't have her, she's mine. And I think the reason why they said that is because I basically went in and did the one thing I didn't know how to do, which was hold a meeting with executives and tell them about how I was going to manage this project. And I did it based on what I knew best, and it was around delivering to the customer's expectations, which I've done since day one. So this was a very successful project. I ended up delivering from what was going to be 250 um, thousand pounds project to 750 thousand pounds and the reason I think I was about 23 or 4 at this stage and the reason why um, I could do that is because I identified opportunities where they could maximize what they were doing so they were delivering a project project deliverables of about 45 items that increased to about 250 items hence why the increase in revenue so much uh, thoroughly enjoyed that role. I got a lot of learnings. I managed uh, a team of copywriters. I was exposed to communication skills that people would dream of. They were just absolutely brilliant people. A lot of them are artists. You've probably seen them on telly um, acting. They all are very uh, professional and fun and goal orientated. So I managed them and I managed these projects. We ended up managing about 27 projects simultaneously. And I was very tired by the end of it. Uh, the, the business trebled in size and I had the opportunity to actually work on the business. So we were looking at the financials of the business. We were understanding how to roll out the business to grow in size, how to influence the culture. Uh, that was a very exciting opportunity and I did it at a very young age and I really enjoyed it and that was fundamental to my career development. Then I met my husband at the time I was at Quiet Room. I should mention Quiet Room actually paid to sponsor me to stay in the country so I could work with them longer. Um, so I was there for in total two years working for Quiet Room, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. But I met my husband and it was a time where the GFC happened. Uh, that we were, we, we had plans to stay there, but the GFC happened, there's a lot of financial uncertainty, there's a lot of economic uncertainty. We were uncertain about his role, my role I was uncertain about, that they were, they were a growing business, but when the GFC hit, a lot of people were made redundant. So we made the decision to come home to Australia and get married and stay here and live. Uh, at that time, it was August I believe, uh, we had a lot of job cuts at Quiet Room as did every other organisation so it was very pertinent timing that we did that. But then um, 
it took me six months to find another job again. Uh, and again, it's because I really want to choose the right jobs. I don't want any job. I was offered two jobs and I turned them down because I knew that I, it wasn't on my career path. I shouldn't choose something just because I get an opportunity to. It had to be part of my career path. My friend recommended the not-for-profit sector and my friend is the one that I used to work with at entertainment publications. She was also working for a not-for-profit now and said, why don't you try and go into not-for-profit? And so I chose a charity close to my heart and they happened to have a role going for senior project officer uh, at Cancer Council SA. So I started at Cancer Council SA and was very determined to grow in the business. Very quickly did I realise that there were a lot of academics. Remember at this point I've only done a certificate three in frontline management and I only have experience. I have no academic qualifications that were good enough to suit Cancer Council and to progress at Cancer Council. There's a lot of doctors there, there's a lot of professors there, there's associate professors there and I was kind of treading water. So I basically just threw myself into a lot of extra duties as well as what I, what I was intending to do. So I took on a lot of extra responsibilities that were around strategy um, as well as operational. Um, you did sort of say this, but what sort of level of uh, academic qualifications do they have that, that PhDs? PhDs, right. yeah. And that's mainly because, yeah, all yeah. cancer researchers um, working upstairs, they've all got PhDs, they're doing lots of different things, yeah. MBAs, um, uh, masters in business administration. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So a lot of them were all either pursuing it or they had already received their qualifications. Uh, we're an evidence-based organisation and yeah, it was kind of pretty clear that I was, um, I was needing to do something further. So I ended up taking on the extra responsibility as I was doing a lot of strategy, a lot of financial modelling for my area and uh, People were looking at me and going, that's great, that's fantastic, but I really don't think that they would have promoted me unless I had shown that I was doing some further activities or further education. So that's when I started thinking, this is probably the time. It's really important for me to tell you that I used to dream about going to university. I used to dream about the fact that I didn't finish school. I used to be very frightened about the fact that my career had a ceiling. I was very scared about how I was going to approach the situation. So I thought I need to go to university and I have no idea what I'm going to do. I have no idea how I'm going to do it because I want to keep working full time. What am I going to do? So I thought about doing a whole bunch of things, marketing maybe. Communications, I mean, they're kind of things that I've done before, but I was worried that I've kind of getting a degree in marketing or communications when I've already done a lot of work experience in there, is that going to fulfill my career objectives for 5, 10, 15 years? What can I do to further my career, not just learn about stuff that I've already applied from an experience perspective? Management, yeah, I think I'd probably need to do management because I want to start managing people, I want to start managing um, departments. So this is this was a very interesting step for me and I spoke to a lot of people about uh, their experience and recommendations for, for education. And then I discovered that UniSA, happens to be where I am today, um, has a five-star MBA rated program. And I spoke to someone that was doing a five-star MBA rated program at UniSA and they could not recommend it any higher. Someone was doing an MBA at Adelaide University and they recommended UniSA. So, <laughs> so I, this was, this was an interesting point because a lot of my relatives said to me, you are not going to be able to do a master's. You haven't even done an undergrad. How would you be able to do a master's? So I panicked a little bit and went straight to the MBA director, Bob, and said, this is my work experience. Um, I don't have an undergrad degree, I've got a certificate three in frontline management, I've got a lot of years experience, this is the stuff that I did. So I applied to him and we had a conversation and he decided yes, I had enough work experience to be able to undertake the MBA. I would have to ta undertake the first year and get good grades and pass and be able to achieve in my MBA to be able to continue. I will tell you, I have a finance exam on Wednesday, um, so this was a little bit scary. <laughs> It's very close in time and if I pass that, I pass my first year. So um, I think it should be alright. 
So I decided to do an, do an MBA and it was the greatest time in my life when I actually enrolled into UniSA and someone said you're going to do an MBA and I was so excited because it's exactly what I wanted to be doing. My next step in my mind from this point is general manager of a, of a department and that gave me all the skills I needed to be able to have interactions with lots of different people that I hopefully am going to be exposed to. So that happened in September I started and in November I was promoted to Merchant Services Manager, which was a huge achievement because I think something to, um, to identify and to recognise is that entertainment publications and Quiet Room were very small agencies. So because of how small they were, I was able to be exposed to a lot of things at a high level. Cancer Council has a lot of different employees and very few managers. So being promoted to a management role at this organisation was probably one of my biggest achievements. Um, so as, as I mentioned now, I, I run the relationship marketing team and uh, am pursuing an MBA and have been getting good grades and thoroughly enjoying it. Um, very stressed out with finance, turns out it's not a strength. Um, okay, finance students in the room? <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, that. let's talk. <laughs> Definitely. Standard deviation, pardon? <laughs> Covariance. I yeah. oh, don't really want to know about them. But at least I can have meaningful conversations with finance managers at some point. Well, they can talk to me and I'll go, yeah, I remember doing something about net present value. Okay, thank you. So I guess you're probably wondering, well, what, what am I going to learn from your experience and um, what can I apply from what you've told me? So what I'm going to just run through is a couple of the key lessons that I've learned uh, along my way and I've kind of identified in my life that these are the most important things that I've had. One, set goals. That's the first thing that I've done is I've set goals and they've been short and long term goals. So as an example, uh, not noticing at entertainment publications that merchant services manager role was the one that I wanted. That goal was five years time and I got it within one year so I had to change my goals. But always set your goals and try not to deviate from that goal. Communication skills. I think it's been quite clear that in my experience I've, I've met a lot of people and uh, I've been able to talk to them and ask open questions and identify opportunities and that's because of the communication skills. You need to be able to talk to people from all ages of all different backgrounds and the best way to do that is to give it a go and to try and ask them questions. Do some preparation if you have to be beforehand to think about the stuff that you want to ask them. It's also important to know how to write on paper as well as communicate verbally. Uh, that has been instrumental with writing my CVs, with writing application letters, making sure that I'm always proofing what I'm writing. Um, I know who I'm writing to. Who's your audience? Make sure you know who your audience is and make sure you market it to your audience. I learnt a lot of my communication skills from Quiet Room, obviously, with the level of um, intelligence uh, and academics we had there. So that was very um, instrumental in my career progression. Networking. Make contacts and keep in contact with them. Um, you know, fundamentally, you need to continue to build relationships with people and check in with them and see how they're going. One of the things that I found really instrumental is another not-for-profit I've made friends with. I found out that they were about to come into market with something purely through having a, a conversation with them. So I identified there was an opportunity in the market that they were going to seize and we had to get in there before they did. <laughs> it sounds silly but it will, it will expose you to understandings from a business perspective and you will then identify when you need to act on something. Keep your ear to the ground. What I mean by that is look Keep looking out for new opportunities. How can you continue to progress your career? The only way you can do that is by asking questions. What openings have come available? Uh, the other day I was offered a role um, at a new, a new location. Obviously I'm not interested in moving, but I found out through someone with, from my MBA that he was interested in a new role. This was perfect for him. And I said, make contact with this person. I'll let them know that you're going to make contact. Within two days he's got the role. It was insane. Uh, and that is because of networking, communicating and keeping your ear to the ground. Be patient. I took six months to find the role at Quiet Room, six months to find the role at Entertainment Publications. No, quite, uh, Cancer Council SA. Be patient. Understand that what you want to achieve might not happen overnight. 
be challenged. Always challenge yourself. This is the one thing that I continuously did, is I kept learning and growing. As soon as I realized and I identified that I wasn't going to have any more opportunities to challenge myself or to learn and refine new skills, I moved. So be brave. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Marcus Buckingham, but Marcus Buckingham talks about um, identifying and refining your strengths and managing around your weaknesses. So the philosophy around that is, if you were to be brilliant at everything, you'd actually be average at it. <laughs> um, whereas if you identify what your strengths are and you continuously refine your strengths, you're going to be great at your strengths and you're going to manage around your weaknesses. So we've just gone through a process at Cancer Council where we've identified through Gallup, I'm not sure if any of you knows that yet, Strengths Finder, what our strengths are. And every time we have something, let's say it's communication or we need to think of a new product or we need to create a new innovation for a campaign, we invite those people with those strengths to our conversations even if they're not in the same business unit. It's about managing and uh, working on your strengths and just managing around your weaknesses. I will say at this point, someone said to me, so if my role means that I'm actually, there's all weaknesses, everything in my role I'm actually not that good at, then you're in the wrong role. Learn from great leaders. It's about recognising who a great leader is and, and trying to adapt their qualities to suit you. Um, learn from their mistakes. Like I did with Cameron, I identified what worked with him, what he was good at, my manager at entertainment publications, um, and I learned from his mistakes and I refined them to suit me. Conversely, recognise bad leaders and bad leadership skills. And when I mean leaders, I mean people who have the ability to motivate and challenge individuals and their skills uh, encourage you to be your best. That's what I mean by a leader, not someone like Steve Jobs who can create amazing technology. It's about someone that has amazing leadership qualities. Always ask questions. I'm sure there's many of times where you've been in a room, in a lecture, or wherever it might be, and you've thought, I have no idea what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Ask. Ask what they're talking about. I do that all the time, and it probably does make me look really bad. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do it in management meetings. I've done it uh, presenting to the board before. I asked a question, what do you mean by that? I don't understand that. What's that acronym? I don't get it. Because if you don't get it, you'll never get it, and you'll never learn and grow. So ask the question. Be embarrassed for that five seconds if you have to be, but I can guarantee you someone else in the room <laughs> is thinking the same thing and you're going to benefit them as well. Be that person. I'm the annoying person in my MBA where I'm constantly asking questions. And people tell me I'm the annoying person in the room. <laughs> but I don't care because I'm learning. I'm getting good grades. Further your study. When the time is right, you're all probably thinking, ah, oh, I'm doing it now, I can't imagine going back and doing it again. There may be a time in your life where further study is going to be right for you and it's going to enable you to develop your career. I'm also doing a Diploma of Management at the, at the same time as doing my MBA, because I'm a masochist. Um, and I did it because I had an opportunity to, through Cancer Council, we've got a placement with an organisation who provides us um, the ability to train all their managers as doing Diploma of Management. I took it because I thought I've actually been given an opportunity to study when that has been my dream to be able to study and learn. I'm not going to say no to it. I'm going to do both. I can't say no to it. So I'm doing a Diploma of Management as well. So recognise when the time is right to do further study. Don't listen to naysayers. Like I said, my relatives were all very much saying, you're not going to be able to do an MBA, you can't do a master's if you haven't done an undergrad. A lot of people were saying, you can't, you, you're never going to get out of hospitality, Katie, you're never going to get out of hospitality. Don't listen to people tell you that you can't do something because you actually can as long as you apply yourself and you're determined to achieve it. Um, you may have to be patient again, um, but you can achieve it. Don't get too comfy. Um, what I mean by that is as soon as you are not challenged, move roles. As soon as you're in a position where you don't feel like you're learning anything, learn something else somewhere else. Because also it gives you exposure to new markets, new audiences, new opportunities. Um, I think that's one of the things about my eclectic history is that I've had exposure to a lot of different things and that's been really beneficial. So just to repeat, set yourself some goals. Communication skills are key. 
try and develop, develop them every day. Network, make friends, ask them how they are, ask them what they're doing, get involved in their life and keep in contact with them. Be open to new opportunities. Um, be challenged. I mean, obviously, you're all doing this um, to challenge yourself and to give you new opportunities, which is fantastic. Refine your strengths and manage around your weaknesses. This one's very important. Really focus on what you are good at. And it may, you may not know for a while, but try and identify that common thread that you have. Recognize great leaders and learn from them. This is really good. This is a thing that I think has been instrumental to me. Who is the person that I can learn from and identifying who I shouldn't be learning from? Always ask questions, keep asking them, and further your study when the time is right. Don't listen to naysayers, you can do it, you can be whatever you want to be, just pursue it, and don't get too comfortable. Obviously I'm in a position now where I am middle management, I'm 30 years, I just turned 30 on Friday, um, 30 years of age, sorry, I've just turned 30 on Friday. It is. Um, it, there is a lot more opportunities for me. I've, I've not even scratched the surface of, of what I am uh, hoping to achieve in my life. So I hope that you'll be able to learn from what I've, what I've um, given you and shared with you today. Any questions? First, let's just clap. <laughs> Blown away. I'm never going to give you my history up to 30, that is for sure. That is pretty <laughs> amazing. Just because I know people take a second to collect your thoughts, I'll start the ball rolling with this question. There's a few questions I had. I was taking notes. I really am blown away. Okay. <laughs> oh, gosh, wow. Um, Kate said, don't choose something that doesn't contribute to your career path. Don't choose something that doesn't co contribute to your career path. Can you tell us about that? Because, I mean, you had to pay the bills. You had two periods of six months. Mm -hmm. and, and what about when stuff happens, like, you know, your partner gets sick or you get sick, you work for the Cancer Council, you know that that stuff happens. Mm -hmm. We've talked in our um, classes about chaos theory, which is about mm. where, you know, for all your good planning, you're on this trajectory, stuff happens. The dog gets run over, your grandmother gets sick, you lose your job, the house goes, the GFC. Yeah. So how, how do you only choose stuff that contributes to career? Can you give some more advice about that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm not sure if I can give you advice, but I can tell you what I've done. <laughs> I think you're well placed to give us oh, advice. Oh, good. Yes. Um, for me, it's about identifying... Um, I'll give you an example. When I was working in London, and I said that it took me six months to find the job for a brand consultancy quiet room, I <sighs> took a temporary role. So I was actually earning an income on a temporary basis so I could actually spend the time looking into other opportunities that were going to help me further my career. So I wasn't, I, I'm a very loyal employee, I think that's m very important to tell you. I'm a very loyal employee so if I'm going to have a permanent job there I'm going to probably stay there and another reason why I should choose the right job. So um, I took a temporary role to enable me to look further and build on my skills at the right role. Question about that. Was, was your temporary role put through um, a recruitment agency that, and, and they just had a whole range of temporary roles and they just sent you from one to another or they just give you one contract? I actually had one contract and I found it on my own. So someone was actually after a role for a six month period. Mm -hmm. So I worked with them for six months. Um, it was actually a company um, that was in Edenbridge and Kent. For those of you that don't know the geographics of um, the UK. It's very far away rural yes. area which I had no idea so I'm very pleased it was temporary um, because I had to drive out to there for two hours every each way on the M25 which is a big loop a freeway around the city and I got lost many times so I'd end up doing a massive loop uh -huh. it took me six hours to get home once but anyway um, I took that temporary role um, and it's because I found it and it was temporary and it was just kind of divine timing Big voice for everyone. I didn't. My husband worked really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't tell you that. Um, <laughs> Good timing there too. At first, actually, no, that's a lie. Um, my husband did work very hard, um, but I actually remember now. I went and worked at my friend's cafe on Perry Street. Cupcake. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. So I um, was working there as a waitress again, but uh, probably only a couple of shifts. I was also planning for a wedding, so admittedly I was pretty happy to be home and not doing that. But I did get offered um, two roles in that time. Um, one of them was working in the Barossa Valley um, for an advertising agency, and I turned that down because ultimately that's not going to help me fulfil my career objectives. And another one was working for a winery doing marketing for them. And that was an exciting opportunity, but I still said no because it was in the Barossa Valley. I knew I had to, to come here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked about uh, naysayers and stuff like that, and I'm just curious. Um, I, in, in Australian culture, there's this sort of, almost a cult, uh, like this culture of like, um, you know, tall coffee syndrome. And um, once you start to notice it, you notice it everywhere. Um, and I'm just curious, uh, you said you were working in the UK. Um, did you? Did you notice it more in Australia, or is it just the same across the board? What What do you mean? Uh, that sort of like tall poppy syndrome, like the, the naysayers, like, oh, yeah. you know, trying to take people down, like, mm. in a sort of subtle... I know what you mean. I was working for an amazing agency, and I don't feel that I was ever exposed to that. Um, so I'd probably say no, but definitely, definitely in South Australia or Australia. But I certainly didn't feel it in the UK as much. Would you say that those naysayers are often the people closest to you, though? Often it's your family. Absolutely. And your when I was, faith yeah, in. when I was determined, yeah, when I was talking about naysayers, it's all the relatives <laughs> <laughs> saying she's definitely not going to be able to do that. There's no way. And even I think I was six months into my MBA, my mum said, "Oh, Katie is doing an MBA," and and they said, "Oh, what does that stand for?" And mum goes, oh, masters in business or something? And they said, no, there's no way she's doing masters in business. She couldn't do it. There's no <laughs> way. And it's really interesting. The naysayers are those that have been closest to me. My sister was always panicking that I was never going to get out of hospitality and achieve anything. <laughs> yes. Can I follow that up? Um, so how do you handle that situation? Because everybody's got relatives <laughs> And some of them are going to be like that. So mm. what, what's your strategy? Do you just not meet up with them and talk to them or do you just talk about other stuff? Um, that's a really good question. I do meet up and talk with them because they're family. Um, and I just say, oh, well, actually, because of the experience I've had, um, I had to meet with the MBA director and they gave me the opportunity. They said I could because my experience was similar to a degree. So I just kind of explain it to them. If they don't get it, they don't get it. That's OK. They don't need to get it. It's not about them. It's about you. There was a question there, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you, earlier in your career you spent a lot of time in the private sector and now obviously you're working in the not-for-profit sector. Is that, um, and you said like obviously you had to scratch the surface of what you want to do in your career, is the not-for-profit sector something that you would consider pursuing further? Really good question. Um, and something that I've thought about too, the thing, I've entered the, I've entered the not-for-profit sector at Cancer Council SA, which is the leading charity in South Australia. So if I was to pursue a career in not-for-profit, it would be with Cancer Council. Um, and I do have aspirations to continue my career with Cancer Council. But if I was to move it out, it would be private. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, how often do you review your career plan? Like mm -hmm. Very good question. Okay, so most recently, um, probably about six months ago, which was, I was, I've been at Cancer Council for two and a bit years at that point, um, I met with a business mentor and spoke to them about what I've done and tried to refine it and tried to understand it and make sure this is the path for me and how long am I going to stay at Cancer Council and what can I achieve there? What other opportunities can I expose myself to at Cancer Council to develop my skills? So I'd probably say the answer to that inadvertently would be about every two years. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you identify uh, a relevant mentor and how do you approach them to ask them to be your mentor? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Uh, the so the way that I um, was in, introduced, I should say, to this mentor is through the HR manager who I befriended at Cancer Council. And I was talking about the need for me to be exposed to executives and to learn from them and to be able to expose myself to lots of different things. And she said, you know, I think what you actually really need is someone who can 
um, mentor you externally because I was talking about internal mentors. So she actually recommended this person and uh, I was going to send her an email and she emailed me first, I think 24 hours after my friend mentioned it and said, I understand that you're interested in a business mentor, let's meet, let's have a coffee. Mm -hmm. So we went and had a coffee and we basically had what felt like five minutes, an hour conversation about what I've done and what I'm trying to achieve and my opportunities at Cancer Council. And she's helped me kind of establish myself in the role of relationship marketing manager. And in fact, it's given me the motivation to do a new strategy that I'm developing at the moment which is cross-organizational because she said you've got an opportunity at Cancer Council you're one of few managers there's a lot of people there there's a lot of opportunities seize it so I kind of went okay I'll do it so that's how I yeah networking I guess it's networking. just just on that point if you are part of the global experience program we have a mentorship mm -hmm. program so you, you can apply you can go online to the GE website so if you're part of the program not just the course you're entitled to that mentoring service but you have to apply and it's competitive because you've got to be matched up with one of our industry partners it might even be someone like Kate in the future so keep that in mind if you're mm. part of the program there was another Fantastic. question I think yes It's a really good question. I a, on my did you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I guess what I mean by wasn't equipped for the role is in my mind, someone's going to want someone that has all the skills and experience that is transferable to that role. So essentially I thought they'd want someone that's been doing it. I hadn't been doing it. I'd just been a waitress and I was okay at it. But um, you know, I, I looked at the role and I thought I've never been an assistant manager. I've never done rosters. I've never done Manage, manage a team of people, um, but I know hospitality, I'm really good at customer service, um, I'll apply for it. And I basically sold myself there, I told them what my passion was, I told them what I was interested in, I told them what my focus was, and in hospitality my focus, especially going to that restaurant, was a sequence of service, is what I identified as you know, how you treat a customer from the moment they come in the door to the moment they leave, and they recognise that, yeah, that's the same as our philosophy. I think very much about um, selling yourself, I think, yeah. thing, and believing in yourself. I mean, as those things all go together. I had that question too, you know, Kate said two or three times, I didn't think I could get the job, but I applied anyway. How do you get that confidence? You know, how do you brace yourself? Is there sort of any advice about, yeah. especially when the naysayers are all around saying you can't do that? Yeah. I think for me, when I say, you know, I didn't think I could get the job, it's because I imagined how many people would be applying for it that had more experience potentially and more... Um, uh, education than, than I had. So one of the things that I just learned from this business mentor, she said, if you're doing your CV and when you're doing your CV, you need to make sure you, you don't sell everything on paper, but you highlight some of your key things. So mm -hmm. for me, I was highlighting key things. First female to be promoted nationally, increased uh, Cancer Council net revenue by X, as an example. So I think they're the most important things to do and to sell yourself. Um, how to stand out on a CV is all about, we spoke earlier, spell the name right. Ask if it's to Kate, if you're applying to me, dear Kate. Not Mrs. Krieg, if that's not what I've got on there, dear Kate. Um, and to just do a very short, sharp, punchy, how are you going to meet the expectations of the role? And that's it, and sell yourself when you're there. Again, if you're part of the Global Experience Program, you have access to a whole range of services, especially <coughs> including Lynn Salby and her team and career services. If you want to get that CV looking just right, if you want help with your application, it's here for you. And if, as part of the course, you have to do self-directed activities, so you actually get to tick that box. And say, oh, Lynn, you've got lots and lots of um, seminars being offered, right? And they are on our website. So if you're interested yeah. in doing exactly what Kate's talking about with some real professional help, here's your opportunity to do it and you get credit for it in the course. Sorry, you had another question? Sorry. Um, yeah, my question is about uh, post undergraduate study. Um, and I, I'm sort of coming up to the end of my degree, and I'm sort of applying for graduate kind of positions. And I mean, I mean, I'll just say something about myself. I'm environmental science, so I can appreciate that it's not your area. Yeah, yeah, special. thank you. Um, <laughs> but if I'm, and I'm more of the mind that I'd rather go out and get into a graduate program than go and continue on and do honours or masters. What would be your opinion on, you know, doing the further study now compared to trying to get into a uh, graduate yeah. I hope I'm not going to be contradictory to anything here. Um, There's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> that for me, um, for me, 
holding off, I think, has been very important in, in my career. Um, there is no way that I could have done an MBA, or as an example, or, um, and, and really understand what they were on about mm. and really be able to apply it straight away. So I think for me, um, I would probably consider holding out and getting some work experience and then identifying a time in your life where you could start to introduce extra study. But there's no point. People also want, people want, pe people want to see people that have got experience as well as education. So if you can try and get the best learnings, I would probably hold off for a bit. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm Are you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's a good idea. I mean, someone said to me the other day, oh, you're doing an MBA. Oh, I've just done my architecture degree and I'm thinking about doing an MBA. I said, oh, where are you working? And he goes, I'm not. So I thought it would be a great time. <laughs> no, don't do it. Especially you're not going to... Especially for an MBA. It's especially so for an MBA. It's very practical. Yeah. You've got to do a lot of work um, and a lot of assignments around what you're applying in your workplace. It wouldn't be relevant. It wouldn't be suitable. And, and some of it isn't about that. It might just be learnings. Um, but I wouldn't be able to, even finance, I'm trying to understand finance and I think, okay, I kind of understand that with my projects, I have to do financial modelling, what's the net present value today, I could only do that because of my experience. Mm. I, think, I think we might just hold off now because we have another 45 minutes or so to chat informally with Kate. Don't all mob her. Let her get out there and make sure she gets something to eat. She'll be going back to work and she won't have had time for lunch either. So we will go out and have something to eat and to drink and to network further with Kate. We do have a very small gift oh. from the Global Experience Program. It's a compendium. Oh, lovely. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, you so it. much. Let's thank Kate once more. Thank you. <laughs>